Good evening, everyone. Or as we say in the South, Shalom y'all. And welcome to a very special session at TIU, Temple Israel University, our adult lifelong learning series here at Temple Israel in Memphis, Tennessee. I hope all of you are hiding from the Omicron and Delta variant. By the hour, I'm hearing of members just in the last hour. Um, thank God those who've been vaccinated and boosted are not very ill, but uh, stay safe, everyone, please. A decade ago, uh, we as a congregation focused on living and dying with dignity as our high holiday theme. Um, this is appropriate, of course, since Yom Kippur is our rendezvous with death. And facing death is really about facing life. Uh, after our series of in-person sessions on the five wishes, hundreds of our members signed the five wishes, advanced directives, and discussing end of life from a Jewish lens, which in one sentence means prolonging life, uh, but not prolonging suffering. Um, and by the way, uh, Ajay, are we on me? I see the, the advertisement, but I just want to make sure that whoever's speaking, and I, I will not be speaking much longer. <laughs> um, when our congregation focused on end of life, I met the most wonderful palliative care physician who works of all, at, at, of all places at St. Jude. Her name is Dr. Erica Kay, and she delivered among the most moving Yom Kippur Kippur talks ever um, four years ago in 2017 about her work at St. Jude. Then get this, years after that, like last year, um, I go to pay a Shiva visit at the home of a relative of the deceased. And the deceased, the spouse of the bereaved son um, was so kind and compassionate um, she wasn't even aware of what she was doing to the people in the room um, as I observed her putting others at ease um, with her words, her nonverbal, silent, active presence. Turns out, I didn't know this at the moment, this person, this woman is Dr. Erica Kay's partner at St. Jude. Dr. Holly Spraker Perlman. Both are treasured Temple Israel family members. Okay, I'm building up to the entire hour we're about to enjoy together. Um, out of the blue, after meeting these two wonder people, Dr. K and Dr. Spraker Perlman, I hear from an emergency room physician and fellow Red Sox fan with a South African accent who understands why I, as a Boston and New England native, refer to the hotel in downtown Memphis as the Peabody, not the Peabody. Because I lived in Peabody, Mass, where my father of blessed memory was both the rabbi and cantor. More important than Dr. Alan Moltz's South African lineage, fondness for the Red Sox, or current residents in Phoenix, is the recent book, He and His Cousin, another ER physician, Dr. Robert Shapiro, have written entitled, Saving Lives, Saving Dignity. I realize it's blurred. He'll show you more later which reminded me that it's time to rekindle what many of you watching on Facebook and some on Zoom have endured or been enduring since the last time we as a congregation addressed end of life. The excruciating experience of your loved one's journey with Alzheimer's, 
or minimizing suffering when the outcome cannot be changed, whether it's a child at St. Jude or an elder in the Memphis Jewish home who died at four o'clock this morning and who I will bury tomorrow before Shabbos. I've done over 1,000 funerals in my 30 plus years serving the Jewish people. And doctors Mulk and Shapiro, and I'm sure the doctors at St. Jude have likely cared for hundreds if not thousands of terminally ill patients. But just as Dr. Shapiro and Dr. Mulk share how they were profoundly affected by the death of a spouse and parents, beyond believing that heroic measures are not always the best course of action. I was more moved by Dr. Mulk's personal story at age 25, when his late father insisted that he leave apartheid South Africa for America with these unforgettable words I wanna to quote to you from his book. I want you to go to America, my son, even if it means I never get to see you again. I recall Dr. Mulk writes in his new book, I recall being completely blown away by my father's words at the time. And I remain blown away to this day more than three decades after his passing. How much did my father love me? My father loved me enough to say goodbye and to set me free at his own painful expense and loss. Sometimes saying goodbye, Alan writes, is truly the greatest act of love and selflessness. We will hear Dr. Molk's presentation after Dr. Spraker Perlman and Dr. K present. But I wish to conclude my framing of this most important TIU program with words from Erica. She spoke over four years on Yom Kippur. I keep her talk in my drawer next to me. I requested a transcript. I'd like to close by sharing something that she shared in her talk. And I quote, I'd like to close this Yom Kippur talk by sharing something that a bereaved parent said to me a few days ago. I, Dr. K, was leading a focus group of parents whose children had died from cancer and we were discussing an impossible paradox. Essentially, how does a mother maintain hope that her child will survive in the face of clear and imminent tragedy? Or in other words, how does one balance hopefulness and realism? The group of bereaved parents all thought quietly for a moment. And then one said, I am a Christian. This might sound weird, but I think the answer is found in Judaism. Because if you ask a Jewish person the impossible question, did you choose God or did God choose you? He will answer yes. And if you ask a parent, the impossible question, do you hope for a miracle or do you understand that your child will die? The answer is the same, yes. I think this is what Judaism means to me as a person and as a clinician, Dr. K shared, a community of questioners sharing the burden of the unknowable and answering yes in affirmation of the mystery, end quote. My friends, we are in for a memorable evening. I'll be quiet now as Holly, Erica, and Alan, our three physicians, lead us. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad to see you all today, um, and I hope that you can see me. Um, 
so I get to kick this off, which is really exciting. And um, it's an interesting story how this all came about, but uh, I'll be handing it over to Erica soon, um, someone who I pulled in to help with this as well, since we do have a similar background. Um, so people routinely ask me what I do. Um, and then when I tell them what I do, they tell me how sad that is and how they could never do it. Um, but what I tell them is that um, I routinely get to see people who are living and thriving. And I tell them how amazing it is to see families make loving personal decisions to assure that their children don't suffer when medical interventions fail. I tell them that my medical intervention is empathetic and honest prognostic communication and that I'm not a surgeon, I'm a word surgeon. Um, so palliative care doctors like Erica and I have trained to be um, are available to help and talk through a person's goals and values and their emotional psychosocial situations and preferences and help match medical decisions to those based solely on what the individual has told us that they value. Um, whereas many physicians match medical interventions to the disease, we match medical inter, inter interventions to the patient. Um, so we help individuals understand the risk benefit ratio of proposed medical interventions um, based on their most important goals and values. And so I just want to tell a short story um, about my grandmother um, who grew up in the depression. Um, she was lovingly known to Mama, as everyone in my life called her. Um, she met my grandfather when she was in high school, and they married shortly after he was came back from the Navy. He was drafted. She raised four children um, in Roanoke, Virginia, and she was the matriarch of our family. Um, she was fiercely independent. She drove in her 80s. Um, she lived independently this whole time. My grandfather passed, actually, when I was much younger. Um, several times she would go to a physician and they would tell her something and she would call me and say, well, I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, okay, well, I think you are going to do it. And so I'm going to come and help you understand what they're saying so that you can understand. Um, so this happened multiple times. Um, but I did agree with her when she went to her cardiologist about five years ago, and she was diagnosed with a leak in one of her heart valves um, in her mid to late eighties. Um, surgery would have been tough for her. And she decided that that was something she wasn't going to do knowing that she was asymptomatic. This was just found um, on a scan of her heart. And she's someone who never would have wanted to live in an assisted living or a nursing home. It's something that she valued her independence and she valued um, being in the home that she had shared with my grandfather for most of her life. Um, and so she did pass away um, in February of uh, 2018. Um, it's, she woke up in the morning and I think must have had some chest pain, called 911. And when they arrived, she had already passed in her recliner at home by herself. And as sad as I feel that we weren't there and it's not how I picture or I think how many of us picture what our last moments look like, I always am thankful. What if she had CPR? What if they tried to shock her? What if they put the breathing tube in and put her on a ventilator and we never really recovered any meaningful time with her, but we did all these things to her. Um, and I think we all knew well enough that that is not something that she would have wanted to do, um, but we never formalized that. And so I think in some ways we got lucky and maybe that was her way of going um, that didn't put us through making those decisions without her. Um, and so when I was thinking about this talk and kind of my hope is that Erica can consolidate some of this, and I know Dr. Mulk has a great presentation for us as well. Um, I didn't want to say the top missed palliative care thing or the top, you know, reasons that you should uh, um, think about palliative care, but basically I wanted to talk about the top opportunities that I see um, for this community, which is that we should all choose as an active verb a legal healthcare decision maker, because you'll have one. Um, it just may not be the person that you want. Um, so if this isn't documented, there's a legal kind of um, rubric of who is your healthcare decision maker. Um, and it sounds like in the past, um, there's been opportunities to work on the My Five Wishes documents. The Tennessee form now is called the Advanced Directive for Healthcare form. Um, and I think in 2014 is when many of these things were kind of pulled together, power of attorney, living will, advanced care. So that's something that we would be happy to talk to you about as Temple members, um, either individually or kind of more later on. Um, but that's what we do in the state of Tennessee. 
I also advise you to talk to your healthcare agent. So this person that you choose, tell them what you value. You don't want them to have to guess. Also tell your other family members if they're not your decision maker. Um, and we always joke in palliative care, which is a fun field, despite what the rep is. Um, you know, it's always the cousin from California that may not know what's going on that comes and can make end of life situations very difficult because they may have different views than the people who knew that person on a daily basis and knew them closest to when, you know, these events are happening. Number three, don't be afraid to talk about what you would like for your end of life to look like um, and what your preferences are for medical interventions. So if you are a person that's like, I want to die in my home peacefully, much of the time we can make that happen. Um, I think we think about what medical interventions are possible. And then as a palliative care doctor, I think about what medical in interventions are reasonable, defined uniquely for that individual. Um, so doing everything possible doesn't mean that you will live longer or live better. Um, there's many things we can do and you guys get to decide if we should as medical professionals. Um, Number four, empower your decision makers to make decisions in real time for you or set these down in preferences. Like we have legal documents that can help you set these things down if you feel that that may be a burden for your family, if you um, are at a position where you're, they're making these decisions for you. Um, your opinion always matters more than someone else's opinion about what happens to you, but sometimes you don't have the ability to express those opinions. Um, and so, many people tell us that they feel a burden to make the right decision. So having those preferences documented helps others around you to not feel that burden. And then five palliative care specialists are your friends. So we can help match your goals to medical treatments. Um, but we have to know your values and we have to know your family members values. So you have to talk to them so that we can all share those. Um, and just as a, as a pointed piece of information, Medicare now has a visit specifically for end of life care planning, if you don't know. So you can make an appointment with your physician to talk about these things as well. So um, like I said, I know Dr. K and I are both happy to help in any of these situations. We are both pediatrics trained and hospice and palliative medicine trained. So we have the ability to have these conversations for adult patients as well. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. K to talk a little bit more about uh, resources. Thank you guys. Thanks so much. I'm Erica, and it is a privilege to be here with all of you tonight. Um, and thank you so much to Dr. Spraker Pullman and Dr. Mulk, and of course, Rabbi uh, Micah for introducing us. Um, so I'll reinforce everything Holly said, um, in particular, um, that palliative care um, is not a scary term. And I think people hear the words palliative care and think immediately death and dying. And that's not what palliative care is about. Palliative care is about helping people live as well as possible for as long as possible. And through that mission, we work not just with patients, but with families to figure out what living well means to you. And so, um, you know, if you or a loved one find yourself in a situation where you're worried or scared or don't fully understand the medical situation, please feel empowered to ask for a palliative care consult because that doesn't mean that you're giving up. It doesn't mean that um, end of life is approaching. It means that you value the concepts of quality of life and living as well as possible for as long as possible. And palliative care clinicians are here to help you in that mission. And the other um, important message that I hope people take away um, and that we share often with, with families um, when they're uh, walking the, a journey with a child um, who has a serious illness um, is that we often um, do not get to choose when we die. I mean, medicine has become um, very technologically savvy and we do our best to predict, but in most cases, we don't have that power to know when someone will die. Um, but we can help empower patients to decide how they want to die and sometimes even where they want to be and surrounded by whom. And I think those are really powerful um, 
and important things to think about and have agency and choice in. Thinking through our values and um, what matters to us is also not something for old people, right? And it's not something for sick people exclusively. These are really important conversations for all people. Um, and, you know, I'll share vulnerably when I first became a mother, um, I felt a lot of anxiety all of a sudden about, you know, have I, I haven't really thought through these things and what will happen if um, something suddenly happens to me. And it was a big wake up call, even though I was young and healthy in my 30s, that these were absolutely imperative conversations that I needed to have. And it's best to have these conversations when things are going well, right? You want to start these conversations in low stress moments where you can talk comfortably and authentically um, and informally with the people that you love in ways that are not stressful and not time sensitive or pressured. And so I'm gonna share with you, um, let me see. Here we go, hopefully this will work. Can you see my screen? Nope, I see a Zoom whiteboard. I'm not sure what that is, but here we go. Can you see the conversation project? No, you're still seeing a Zoom whiteboard. Let me try that again. Here we go, share screen. How about now? Okay, so if you type into any search engine, the conversation project, you will come across a really beautiful resource that is entirely free, that was commissioned and led by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement or IHI out of Harvard. Um, and I uh, knew peripherally the gentleman who helped to launch um, this incredible resource about a, gosh, not quite, maybe a decade ago. Um, and their goals were completely selfless. They don't make money or profit um, off of this. Um, their goals are purely to help people begin these critical conversations. And so I want to just take two minutes and help you navigate through this website to just give you a sense of the richness of the resources. And so when you're on the homepage here, you can see that you can get started with a number of free guides. And I'm gonna just show you quickly the conversation starter guide. And I really encourage you on your own time, when you have a moment to Google the conversation project and pull up the conversation starter guide. And you don't have to follow it verbatim, but what it does importantly is normalize the act of having this conversation and take away the formality and stress around it, because these are conversations that can and should happen organically around the dinner table or around the um, coffee table in the living room, um, eating dessert and drinking tea. Um, and they talk through in this guide why this is so important. And then concretely the steps that you will take one at a time to think about what matters to you, to plan your talk, to start talking, and then importantly, to keep revisiting the conversation. And I won't go through all of this, but just on a quick scroll, this is the general sense um, of you know, thinking about what matters to you with anchoring questions, like what does a good day look like for you specifically? Because what a good day looks like for me is different than what a good day looks like for Micah or for Holly or for any of us. These are deeply personal, subjective answers. And who are your sources of support and what matters to me through the end of my life? And so you can see as I scroll quickly that there are a number of questions to help your loved ones truly understand what your wishes are, what your goals are, and what a life of dignity looks like so that they can help make sure that at whatever time um, is your approaching end of life, that you have the same degree of dignity through those steps. And then, um, you know, I hope that you'll explore the, there's not just a conversation starter guide, but a guide to choosing a healthcare proxy, the, pe the person or people that will make decisions for you in the event that you are unable to make those decisions for yourself. 
as well as guides for how to be a healthcare proxy, how to talk to your healthcare team, workbooks about figuring out what matters most to me, um, as well as others. And so lastly, I'll share very quickly, um, here we go, in our state, what an advanced directive form looks like, which everyone should fill out. And these are forms that um, state that you are giving instructions for how you would wanna be treated if there came a time that you couldn't make those decisions for yourself. And again, I won't look through this in uh, detail and I hope that you will look it up, um, but you can indicate your wishes for what you would want in specific situations and then your wishes for specific treatments. Um, and it's a fairly short form, but I would encourage you to spend time talking through the conversation guide from the conversation project um, before filling out these forms, because it can really help give you clarity um, for what's most important to you. And so with that, I will pass the baton. Am I still sharing my screen, guys? No, you did. But thank you, uh, <laughs> members of the Temple family, uh, Dr. K, Dr. Sprager Perlman. And now it's my pleasure to reintroduce the honorary member of Temple Israel from our back and forth, uh, uh, my shul's your shul. Here he is wearing the shalom, not the shalom y'all hat, but the shalom hat. Here he is, Dr. Alan Malk. Well, Rabbi Mike, I firstly thank you so much for that incredible introduction. At this point, all I can say is wow, wow, and wow. I have been, to say that I've been blown away by Drs. Holly and um, Dr. K uh, is an understatement. Uh, you have made my job tonight so much easier. Uh, you've covered many of my slides so succinctly and magnificently that uh, it's gonna shorten my presentation. And I think some of my presentation is now gonna be a little bit of comic relief perhaps uh, to uh, talk about this rather somber but important subject. So let me get cracking and you'll see that I'm going to be- I'm, I'm only going to interrupt. I hope you, this, you're going to tell your story along the way. I, yes, yes. I, I, that is definitely part of uh, the story. Um, once again, thank you so much. And thank you also, Lynn, for um, enabling this evening to happen. I'm going to start off by acknowledging the city of Memphis, uh, Rabbi Michael Greenstein and his uh, amazing um, crew and Temple Israel as well as the doctors Spraker, Pullman, and Kay. So here we go. Why is this not moving? Okay, there we go. So there it is, Memphis, Tennessee, a magnificent city by the Mississippi River, which I vow to visit, vow to make on my bucket list. The city of Graceland, Elvis Presley, my hero is a kid growing up in a little shtetl in South Africa where he was a household name. Um, one of the amazing attractions, no doubt, of Memphis, the city of Memphis, well known for its amazing history of civil rights and the actual civil rights museum, the National Civil Rights Museum is located there. Um, the city of the blues, there we see B.B. King, arguably the greatest, one of the greatest blues guitarists of all time a city of incredible music and the city of, there we go, Federal Express. And needless to say, the city of St. Jude Children's Hospital. So I'm also gonna add this, that Jewish life in America, a lot of Jewish people in America think it's really centered around the Northeast, Chicago and LA, you know, Philly, New York, Boston, uh, Chicago and LA and that the concept of Southern Jewry, what? That must, that's an oxymoron, right? You know, Memphis, Tennessee, south of the Mason-Dixon line, you know, the home of that woman <laughs> you see over there, Dolly Parton, uh, you know, the home of hillbillies. And I say to these folks where Jewish life is, uh, uh, you know, is, is centered, uh, Philly, New York, Boston, LA, 
Chicago, I tell you, ah, wrong, 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 because I've got news for you. In, in, in Memphis, there's a place called Temple Israel, which is beautiful, beautiful building and sanctuary, and headed by its fearless leader, Dr. Micah Greenstein. And when I look up Dr. Greenstein, I found out that he is named one of America's top 50 rabbis. He's received the MLK to the Be the Dream Legacy Award. And he uh, just brings up the concept for me of alliterations, ebullient, exuberant, energetic, effervescent, enthusiastic, and need, need I also add, excellent. And also a Red Sox fan. And Rabbi Micah, you look pretty darn good, I have to say, in a Red Sox ski cap. Go Red Sox. So going back again to the Jews of Philly, New York, Boston, Chicago, and LA, uh, I got to tell you, for 168 years, Temple Israel has existed, started in 1853 by German Jews, of course. They were the pioneers of Reform Judaism. Unbelievable. And so I have to remind you that Jewish life is alive, well, and thriving in Memphis, Tennessee, thanks to the people I've mentioned. And now I have to acknowledge Dr. Erica Kay and Dr. Holly Spraker Pullman. Yiddish Kip, the Prudel of Yiddish Kop, mega major Yiddish Kip. And, you know, MD stands for medical doctor. But in the case of these two incredible ladies, in their case, MD also stands for mitzvah doctor. These two individuals, when they get up in the morning and make their way to Danny Thomas Place, they are doing God's work beyond, beyond. I could never do what you do. I could, these two people could easily have done something more glorious, like become cardiac surgeons or plastic surgeons or interventional cardiologists, but they chose this specialty because the M also stands, by the way, for Mensch, Mensch doctor. And to both of you, I tilt my Jewish mafia hat, I tilt my keep up and I of course tilt my Red Sox cap to all three of you. You guys are incredible. Okay, now a little bit about me. Uh, a little intro about myself. That by the way is not me. I was never that thin. And the last time I had that much hair was about 16 years old. But that is a picture of an ER doctor in a resuscitation bay awaiting a patient needs to be resuscitated. It could be a stab victim, a trauma victim, a heart attack, an unconscious patient, a uh, overdose, et cetera, et cetera. But I am not your average ER doc. I'm firstly the father of triplets, Asher, Ariel, and Eliza. That's them on the left as infants and on the right as students at the U of A in Tucson. And that's me accompanying them to a Costco while they were in college, make sure making sure they had food and supplies and uh, being the dad. Uh, one of my children is married, that's Eliza under the chuppe in San Diego on the beach. And to the right is my wife, Laura, she's an attorney. Uh, through her, I have learned the amazing ability to compromise and negotiate that two of the major secrets of a good marriage. And on the rare occasions that I win an argument against her, I do one of those, and that is rare, that is rare. I am also, as I said, a very avid Red Sox fan. That's me in Fenway Park at the top. At the bottom, I'm in Manhattan, giving the thumbs down in front of a Yankee store. Four Red Sox world champions that I've lived to see, very privileged for that. Big dog lover, these are my two dogs, uh, Disco and Sunday. Dogs are amazing. Dogs are soft and gentle and warm and fuzzy, which is, what I like, humans should be more warm and fuzzy as well. Like these dogs, for example. Okay. I also am an avid music fan. I always work at Christmas and at Christmas time, I play the accordion for my patients. That's between sync patients for the staff, for the nurses, the other docs, and uh, bring a little 
joy to my Christian friends. Uh, love, love, love being Jewish, love my Jewish identity. I have been called by many as a Meshuggah goofball. I wear that badge with a little bit of honor, as you can tell. <clears throat> I'm the eternal optimist. When I was in medical school, I was the class clown. I love to be a jokester. I love Milton Burns saying that laughter is the best medicine in the world. I love comedy, and these are some of my favorites. There are many more. These are all Jewish comedians, Alan King, Joan Rivers, Don Rickles, Jackie Mason, um, <clears throat> Rodney Dangerfield. These, are, these five are all deceased, but the other three still alive. Billy Crystal, Sandra Bernhardt, and Jerry Seinfeld. I love the Jewish, amazing Jewish actors in history, the Three Stooges, the Marx Brothers, of course, Mel Brooks, one of these great movies, Young Frankenstein, and in there you see Gene Wilder, Marty Feldman, Madeleine Kahn, all Jewish and sadly all deceased. And sitcoms of The Odd Couple, Neil Simon, The Nanny, with um, <clears throat> Fran Drescher, and even The Munsters, you see Al Lewis there, who was grandpa, he was Jewish as well. So people who know me really cannot believe that I ever wrote a book about a topic was serious. So what prompted me? What prompted me to do this? Well, my journey with my mother, Sirona Malk, of blessed memory, and her journey with Alzheimer's. And I started to write this book before she even passed away as a catharsis to deal with my own grief and her deteriorating condition. Ariel, my daughter, walked by me one day as I was typing away, and she said, what are you doing, Dad? And I said, oh, I'm just writing stuff about Boba. And she said, you mind if I take a look? I said, sure. She was an English major, and she said, hmm, Dad, for someone who's never taken a course in writing, you're not half bad. So I looked at her, I said, you think I should write more? She said, absolutely. And that's how the book came about. My beloved mother was the most harmless person I ever knew. She was absolutely my role model, always positive, always found good in people, the ultimate altruist, and she would never, ever have wanted to be a burden on her family. Yet in some ways, her worst nightmare did come true. Quick reminder that life as we know it on earth, whether we like it or not, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's a bris at the top, <clears throat> a Jewish wedding with a groom stomping on the glass, and a funeral. We in the medical community still look as death as the ultimate enemy. But to many patients and their loved ones, death often comes as a friend. I can remember when we came back from my mother's funeral, looking at my brother, Ian, who's a cardiologist in New Jersey. I looked at him, the two of us in the car, and I said, is it just me? Or do you feel a huge sense of relief? And he looked at me and said, absolutely. Even Christian Barnard, who's the pioneer heart surgeon, South African, also claimed and noted that death isn't necessarily bad. It often achieves what medical technology cannot achieve and actually stop the suffering of the patient. A reminder that not everyone makes it to a ripe old age. These people are all 100 and beyond. Amazing, God bless them. I remember once visiting my mother's grave and I walked around and I couldn't believe how many people buried there didn't even make it to 60. Here are some famous examples. Daniel Pearl, murdered at age 38. Gilda Radner, 42, ovarian cancer. Amy Winehouse, 27, overdose. Marilyn Monroe, 36, overdose. Lenny Bruce, likely the father of stand-up comedy, overdose at age 40. And of course, Elvis Presley at age 42. A nationwide survey was done of physicians that they were asked, where do you want to be at end of life? And over 80% said, at home, surrounded by family and loved ones. And yet we as physicians have this double standard going. Many of our patients still die in the ICU, receiving aggressive, heroic, yet futile care that does nothing but prolong the needless suffering. Thumbs down for that. This is just a slide to talk about what we do when our pets are suffering, our dogs. And it brings me to the thought that maybe we should be thinking similarly for our loved ones when it comes to end of life care. Many people have given the option of aggressive care. On the left, you're seeing someone on dialysis. On the right, you see Barbara Bush, who choose B. 
if given the option and given the information, now I'm not saying dialysis is all bad. There are a lot of people on dialysis who have very good, <clears throat> who have good quality of life, but many people unfortunately do not. Definition of dignity, what's dignity? To me, it's the state of being worthy of honor and respect, especially self-respect, definitely related to quality of life. And of course, what quality of life is for one person may be different for someone else. And of course, I acknowledge that. How important is dignity? Physicians were asked the question, what single life-changing event would indicate that you've suffered a serious compromise of your dignity? And the answer, the inability to wipe yourself after a bowel movement. Think about that for a second. Could be a game-changing decision-making in some certain situations. Sadly, so many of these life-limiting conditions strip us of our dignity, and I've mentioned them down below. They are also the commonest reasons people need palliative and hospice care, Alzheimer's, metastatic cancer, end-stage congestive heart failure, end-stage emphysema, end-stage liver disease, diabetes with multiple complications, Lou Gehrig's disease, and other neurological diseases and advanced frailty. What is frailty? A condition of being weak and delicate, generally not reversible, and generally does not suggest a good prognosis. Now, talking about end-of-life care seems somewhat counterintuitive for an ER doc like me, right? Because how are we as ER docs wired? How are we wired? What are we about? Well, we love an adrenaline rush. We love to resuscitate and stabilize. We love intubating, putting in chest tubes, central lines, being diagnostic sleuths, saving lives. We loathe the full waiting room, thinking there are 30 patients out there who need to come back that we need to take care of. We loathe being unsuccessful in resuscitating. We loathe missing a diagnosis. We loathe giving up. And we reluctantly accept that we cannot mend society's ills, even though we deal with them all the time, be it unemployment, mental illness, <clears throat> domestic violence, homelessness, and drug abuse. So how did I develop an interest and passion for this? So in addition to my mother's journey, the face of medicine, emergency medicine and medicine in general has changed drastically in the last 30 years, with the obesity and diabetic epidemic obesity and diabetes epidemic playing a significant role. No surprises there. Patients have become sicker, disease process more complicated, more comorbidities, aging population, unintended consequences of medical science to prolong life, too much being done for too many patients with poor quality of life for too long, loss of dignity. And I began to realize what we're doing is morally not right. It's inhumane, unkind, and probably not even good care. Healthcare versus disease management. I love this one because it tells us the difference. Healthcare implies preventive medicine, managing high blood pressure, cholesterol, cancer screening, keeping people healthy. Disease management, well, that's when diseases have set in and examples of these are dialysis, coronary bypass, strokes. Healthcare, low maintenance, low cost, high yield. Disease management, the opposite. High maintenance, high cost and reduced yield. kind of like closing the barn door once the horse has, a, has bolted. I'm gonna skip the slide, <clears throat> but there are many examples in my book that I talk about, about the revolving door of the ER, about how so many patients keep coming back, keep coming back really on cured and really sh should be considered for palliative and hospice care. I'm gonna give you an example. This is real, really happened within a two hour period I saw these three patients and I'm gonna quickly run through them. This is a woman with multiple complaints. She was 70, but she looked more like 90. She had multiple conditions. She had previous pulmonary embolus, peripheral vascular disease, breast cancer, diabetes, emphysema, kidney stones, aortic aneurysm, severe arthritis, anxiety and depression. I would be too. Severe coronary disease and she lived alone. The next one is a man only 60, retired military, morbidly obese, broke, hurt his ribs. Um, multiple medical conditions, atrial fibrillation, previous stroke, weakness, pacemaker, coronary disease, cardiomyopathy, diffuse arthritis, diabetes, sleep apnea, chronic disease on dialysis, and three broken ribs to add to his misery. The third one was a widowed male, age 92, was just discharged from the hospital two days earlier with pneumonia and congestive heart failure. Now he fell, luckily no bad injuries, other medical conditions, family felt they couldn't take care of him, wanted to put him in a skilled nursing facility, 
patient himself refused and wanted to live, continue living independently. We've heard this one many times before, and we see these type of patients every single day in every ER in America. These patients were rare 30 years ago. At the bottom, I'm just quoting about a 300 pound patient I once saw with a sprained ankle, and I said to him, do you have any other medical problems? And he responded, no, I'm in great health. And that has become the new norm with the diabetes and obesity epidemic in America. Briefly, I'd like to talk about the crystal ball epiphany I had with my mother. I was visiting one day, a few months before she died. At this point, she was already in a wheelchair, staring into space, no longer recognizing me, needed to be fed, incontinent, totally stripped of all her dignity. And sudden, something crossed me. I thought to myself, what if five years ago, I went to her and I said, mom, I have a crystal ball right here. I want you to take a look in it. This is what you're gonna look like five years from now. What would she have said? I knew exactly what she would have said. She would have said, please push me over a cliff. That's what she would have said. She would never have wanted to be in that state. The last thing I remember saying when she still had a little bit of insight left before Alzheimer's truly took over, she, she was starting to realize things weren't going well. And she looked at me and she said, give me a second. And she said, Alan, I'm so sorry that I've become a burden on you. She would never have wanted that. Of course, there's the flip side to that coin. And there are many situations where family and loved ones consider it an honor, a privilege, and a mitzvah, and a duty to care for an aging parent and loved one. And it's not a burden. This is wonderful. It's praiseworthy. It's a huge mitzvah. The professional patient, this is a term I sort of coined myself. And this is when your life is that of being a full-time patient. You've got specialists in every organ system. You spend your life being a patient. I sure would not want that. Think about, think about that one for yourself. Now, I've, all I've become, I've become a fan of brutal honesty. And at this point, I'm going to talk about the baby boomers. We need a reality check. Our numbers are rising. In 2030, healthcare for us is going to be a big problem. 28% of healthcare dollars is used on the last few months of life. That needs to be revisited. We are part of the diabetes and obesity epidemic. We want everything done. And there are many people who think that we're going over the fiscal cliff. And do we in fact deserve all this? And what are we leaving behind? Is this fair to the next generation? Are we gonna leave behind a bankrupt system? Something that's not sustainable? Are we gonna leave behind a world that has been destroyed by pollution, climate change, and so on? We need to rethink this, we members of the <clears throat> baby boomers. I wanna quickly debunk some myths Doctors are not gods. We are human and mortal. As hard as we try, we cannot reverse the aging process. That the boogeyman you see in the top right hand corner. He is a myth. Bigfoot is a myth. Doctors can cure everything. Well, that's a myth. We can cure a lot of things, strep throat, bladder infections, some early cancers, but we cannot cure Alzheimer's, ALS, and stage four cancer. What we do is disease management. We can have medications for diabetes. We have antidepressants. We've got inhalers and we've got stents for coronary bypass and we have dialysis. That's called disease management. That's not a cure. Doctors save lives all the time. That's another myth. In Hollywood, oh yeah, of course, in ER, Chicago Hopes and elsewhere, we see that, but in real life, we occasionally save lives. Occasionally a stab wound, occasionally we put, save some of carbon monoxide poisoning and so on and so forth. Kidney and liver transplants give patient additional lease on life, but they are not a cure. Patients are immunosuppressants for life and organ rejections happen too. Now I need to debunk a major myth. And from this point, I'm probably going to be deleting some slides because Drs. Spraker, Perlman and Kay have covered this so magnificently and superbly that it's going to, much of these slide next ones may just be redundancy. But I do want to emphasize that hospice and palliative care are not death panels. We are not giving up. It's compassionate care for patients and families who are suffering. Here's another myth. Having the conversation will traumatize and scar you. On contraire, you will be glad if you've had the conversation. What palliative care is not, it's not pulling the plug, it's not death panels, 
It's assessing goals of care, respecting patients' wishes, and symptom management, helping the pain, helping the shortness of breath, anxiety, helping families. And it's appropriate as uh, we've already outlined, as my uh, doctors Kay and, and Inspector Plum outlined, even in children, even when you're hoping for a cure. And we address the physical, intellectual, emotional, social, and spiritual needs. Beautiful, beautiful. Very high percent of patients in palliative care do end up with hospice. It's a paid medical benefit for the last six months of life. And when I've had patients placed on hospice, when the hospice nurses have come to the ER, the only complaint was, gee, I wish you preferred the patient to us sooner. We could have done more to help. And there are three different, I've mentioned three different hospice um, organizations, well-respected in the Memphis area, Crossroads, Avalon, and Amidisis. All it takes is a phone call to hospice. I'm talking about the crossroads here uh, for a reason because of the next slide, that end of life care involves the crossroads of medicine, law, ethics, religion, personal choice and autonomy, especially when it comes to medical aid in dying, something that is not legal in either Arizona or, um, or in Tennessee, but legal in many other states. It's a totally separate discussion, somewhat controversial. Uh, Rabbi Greenstein is, uh, Definitely the person to speak to about this as well from the standpoint, very much controversial in Judaism as well, for sure. And certain diseases like Alzheimer's and mental illness are not eligible for medical aid in dying anyway. Now, this all may sound counterintuitive. I'm not a maverick, I'm not a renegade, I'm not a dirty rotten scoundrel, and I'm not a crook. But the good news is I have the backing of American College of Emergency Physicians and the American Medical Association who absolutely support and encourage the use of palliative and hospice care in appropriate situations. So that's good to know that we have the backing of <clears throat> our peers. These are proven data benefits, symptom improvement, length of life, patient satisfaction, less, less PTSD. And um, I, I'm not gonna talk anymore because Dr. K already covered this beautifully as did uh, Dr. Spraker Pullman. Um, some patients are sick and tired of being sick and tired and may actually welcome the opportunity to have this conversation. As a song goes from Showboat, Old Man River, magnificently sung by the great Paul Robeson, the, one of the end lines say, I'm tired of living and scared of dying. That is the time to have the conversation. Actually, the conversation, as Dr. K mentioned earlier, should be had long before, but certainly this would be the time to talk. Talk to your family, your doctor, your attorney, preferably the state planning attorney and your rabbi. Dr. Greenstein with his infectious, contagious smile, or if he's not available, Dr. Simons, Dr. Wilmer, Dr. Dreyfus, and maybe even Cantor Hoffman. Another quick ride about life having a beginning, a middle and an end. We're gonna talk here about planning and preparation. Okay, we'll start about the beginning. Okay, Rachel has missed her period. She's late. She gets a pregnancy test and ha ha, mazel tov. She's pregnant, she's happy. She's got thumbs up. There's a baby in her uterus, all good. And she starts to plan. Everyone's happy planning for the prenatal visits planning for the baby's room, planning for the baby shower, lots of planning and preparation, all exciting. And then comes the blessed moment, little David, uh, <clears throat> or little, um, I think we'll call her Leah. Little David, little Leah is born, blessed day, mazel tov. We fast forward, we fast forward, because now little David, little Leah are having their bar and bat mitzvah. And how about the preparation that goes into that? The mafteh, the Torah portion, the Torah, the guests, the DJ, the food, the invites, lots of preparation and planning. We fast forward again to now little David and little Leah have finished high school. It's time to apply for college. We're going to go to University of Memphis, University of Tennessee, maybe back east, maybe Yeshiva University, maybe Brandeis or Harvard in Boston, Red Sox country or maybe go to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Anyway, we fall forward, they've now completed college and it's time to apply for a job. Think of all the work and the effort and the plan that goes into the resume, the CV and the interview. And now we've landed a great job 
and we fast forward, and now it's again Simon Tov and Mazel Tov because Rachel and Leah are married. Think of the preparation there. We had to even hire a, a wedding planner, Oy, Gavald, all the planning, unbelievable. We fast forward again to retirement. Now it's retirement time. We do a lot of planning for that too, for travel, for health, for pension, etc., etc. And we fast forward one more time to end of life. How do we plan for that? With silence, with sweeping it under the rug. Largely, not everyone, but too many people. Shtum, the Yiddish word for quiet. Sheket for Hebrew. Or as Simon and Garfunkel said, the sounds of silence. Thumbs down for that. And to remind a good death is not an oxymoron. You don't believe me? Look at the obituaries in the, in the Memphis papers. Listen to a beautiful eulogy. Go to a shiva call. And if the doctor doesn't have a conversation with you, be your advocate. This is already covered by Dr. K, or I think it was, could have been Dr. Spraker Pullman about your doctor gets paid for having a conversation. I recommend that you individuals, the lay people, become educated and enlightened about invasive life altering treatment. Ask questions. Find out what it's like being on a ventilator, being on dialysis, getting a transplant, transplant being option dependent. Do your diligence. You'll be glad you did. Go to Google. Go to YouTube. Everything is on YouTube. Even the 2004 Red Sox World Series is on YouTube. Okay. Um, many wonderful resources. The conversation project was already mentioned um, by Dr. <clears throat> Dr. K. It's based out of Boston. I love that. Compassions and Choices, based out of Denver. Many other wonderful resources that you can uh, look up online. And there's the Power of Attorney form in Tennessee that you can download and you can talk to your state planning attorney. And while you'll be doing a mitzvah again for yourself and your family, be it sudden death or expected death, it'll make their lives and their bereavement so much easier. Do it, it's a mitzvah. Ah, and what else might you accomplish? A bucket list. Ha, ah, wouldn't that be nice? You can plan to go to South Africa or Tanzania or Kenya on safari or come to Arizona to the Grand Canyon or go to the Western Wall in Israel and Daven there, or go on an Alaska cruise, or see the Taj Mahal, or like that 85-year-old man, go skydiving. He's a complete Meshuggah, by the way, but that's another discussion. Uh, and we need a culture change in medicine and in the real world to make end-of-life palliative and hospice care become more accepted and less taboo. And the culture change requires more education, willingness to embrace and understanding that it's good care, uh, excellent care, and it is not giving up. And that um, losing a patient doesn't automatically mean failure. And we have to remind doctors of this all the time. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, we in the medical community are definitely part of the problem. Not too long ago, two palliative care doctors here were fired from their jobs because two specialists who were oncologists complained that they were interfering with their care. And I look at that and I think that is Chazerai, but never, you won't uh, hear me uh, talk about that anymore. This is an overheard conversation in the ICU between a nephrologist, a kidney specialist and a nurse. The nephrologist, mm, true, happened at our hospital. Her kidney function has declined. We need to start dialysis, the ICU nurse, the doctor, she's 103 years old, nephrologist. Ah, but she's a good 103. The ICU nurse's response, you've got to be kidding me. You see, too many doctors are hammers. And when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. To every nephrologist, any patient with kidney failure sounds like dialysis. It makes them money. To a cardiologist, you've got chest pain, stents. It makes them money. To, <clears throat> I'll stop right there. I think you get my drift. And we often default to aggressive care, aggressive care, intubating, resuscitating, when we should pause and reconsider. Rabbi, you already covered this about, you brought tears to my eyes when you read that uh, portion from my book. Indeed, saying goodbye can be the ultimate act of love. No question about it. And these pictures tell it all. I also encourage you to embrace your spirituality, big time. 
Rabbi Micah is an expert on this, no doubt. Without a doubt, those who are connected to higher power do so much better. I've seen this over and over and over again, as I'm sure have Dr. Ske and Spraker Pullman. These are some rights to the dying, the right to die in peace and dignity, nothing earth shattering here, be free of physical pain. Primary care physicians do a poor job, they need to do better. We discussed that as well, at least Dr. K did. I'll give you one example of why it's not a good idea to not have a discussion, why it's important to have discussion ahead of time, because sometimes we have patients coming to the ER in dire distress, near death, already comatose. And I have this one example I'm going to quote. I'm almost done, by the way. Very anxiety producing for me when I have to deal with a 94 year old woman with dementia, bedridden from a nursing home with, with pneumonia, unresponsive, clearly a death store, no advanced directives, and the two daughters are at odds. One daughter says, I don't want my mother to die, put on a respirator if you have to. And the other daughter says, I don't think she wants to be on a respirator. And that's me on the right with my arms shrugged. Luckily, we were able to resolve this, and she uh, the lady died peacefully an hour later. Um, many physicians are poorly trained in end-of-life conversations. We have to do better on that one. And that gets the thumbs down. However, there is good news. By having the conversation, conflict management can be addressed, just like it happened with these two daughters. And more good news, there are currently over 100 ER doctors who have completed a fellowship in palliative and hospice care. And many hospitals have active and vibrant palliative care programs who meet with families. And that gets thumbs up, baby, thumbs up big time. These are some helpful catchphrases we teach doctors. Uh, this is the Ariadne program that I think Dr. Perlman and Dr. Kerr were familiar with. We teach doctors how to ask proper questions and engage with family. And even if the initial conversation doesn't go well, when we talk to patients, we've done something worthwhile. We have planted the seed. And very often they'll come back a few day or a few week or so later and say, we're ready to have the conversation. We cannot underestimate the power of planting the seed. What does dignity mean to you? What it means to me is autonomy, making peace. This is so important. I know Rabbi Michael will concur 100%. Asking for forgiveness, repairing fractured relationships, not being a burden, going to our end peacefully and with serenity and being grateful. That, that's what it means to me. Quick word about the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. It caught us off guard, unforeseen, unimaginable, horrible trail of devastation. Thousands of people into 2021, hundreds of thousands, not realize it could be a last year on earth, and an incredible reminder, sobering reminder of the need to have a conversation and advance directives. And most recently, the horrible tornadoes that hit Illinois, Kentucky, Missouri, Arkansas, and Tennessee. These people never knew that their last day on earth was just around the corner. This is our book, it's available on Amazon. <clears throat> This is Dr. Shapiro's website, Lives Are Meaningful, that you can go to. He'll be happy to talk to you. And now I want to wish the Memphis teams, University of Memphis Tigers and the Memphis Grizzlies, good luck. And of course, go Red Sox. And now my best Elvis imitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that wasn't that good. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. I'm going to end the end the stop share right here, and hand it over to uh, to Rabbi Micah. And whoever wants to ask questions, I'm done. One of the most entertaining, captivating presentations, and I think it all comes down to the two P's that you. I think it was slide 84, planning and preparation. I confess that when we have authors speak it's usually sharing the book but you could be in peoria or philadelphia you know more about memphis than memphians so <laughs> thank you so much you're not only an md a medical doctor and a mitzvah doctor uh you're also a mensch and if anyone asks mulk was marvelous <laughs> and we're going to 
uh, treasure this tape, which I know many are watching on Facebook and will, hundreds and probably thousands will get the resources thanks to Dr. Erica Kay, Dr. Holly Spraker Perlman, and Dr. Alan Mulk. Shabbat is going to be arriving um, tomorrow evening, and it never hit me till Dr. Mulk's presentation. When we talk about Shabbat as an island in time, we're really talking about a culture of compassion. We're really talking about a compulture of dignity and acceptance and all those definitions. I just want to share, this is a picture of Seth Strick, a St. Jude patient, a medical student who passed away at age 21. And before we were blessed to have Erica and Holly at St. Jude, when I came here 30 years ago, I believe about 80% of the kids died and only 20% lived. Um, now the numbers have flipped and doctors Kay and Spraker Perlman are with the 20% who are living as well for as long as they can. And an emergency physician is now part of the compassionate project of palliative care. But I learned two things, and with this I'll close, and then we'll leave Facebook, we'll stay on, those of you on Zoom, to speak with the doctors briefly. I learned before my teachers, Dr. K and Spraker Perlman came here, from being with children when they were dying, that they were really afraid of two things. They weren't afraid of dying. They were afraid of being in pain and being alone. And I really believe that the holy work that these three doctors are doing, we can all model, we can all do. It's not that hard. Let's not sweep it under the rug. Shabbat Shalom to everyone. Those of you on Facebook, have a sweet Shabbat. Everyone on Zoom, stay on.